Yo, yo, just a disclaimer. This podcast is meant for informational purposes only. We are not financial advisors, so please do your own research. Welcome to Going Deep with AJ and Vernon, presented by Vayner Sports Pass. Welcome, everybody, to the first ever uh, Vader Sports Pass podcast. It's called Going Deep with me, and my guy Vernon here. Um, we're super excited about this. You know, uh, Vernon and I just did a Twitter AMA recently, and when we dropped the news that we were launching a podcast, just appreciated the love so much from the community. People are psyched to hear this. I think people want more and more content from us, our team, our clients. And so with that, we're here ready to do it. And uh, just to give you some context for how this podcast is going to work. Again, going deep is the concept and, you know, a little bit of a play on words. My guy Vernon's gone deep a few hundred times in his MLB career. Um, but it also is a double meaning in the sense that we plan on also going deep with our guests. And the way we're looking at this and the way we look at Vayner Sports Pass is we're really sitting at the intersection of sports and NFT culture. And so each episode is going to feature either one or two guests. We're either going to always have an athlete or somebody from the NFT industry. And sometimes we'll have both. And uh, just really excited to get this going. Something that Vernon and I have talked about, something that we as a company have talked about for a long time. And, you know, we're going to kind of crawl before we walk, walk before we jog and jog before we run. But I'm really confident between the two of us and the team that we have behind us and the great guests that we have, that we're going to be able to put together something pretty special here. So I'm excited. Um, We got some great people to talk to in the pipeline. And uh, Vernon, I'm going to kick it to you. Talk a little bit about, you know, what you want to do here in the podcast in your eyes. Yeah, I think like you said, it's it's content. It's having fun. It's talking talking about things we know and uh, getting to know people uh, a little deeper. I think it's I think it's awesome when people who aren't familiar with certain athletes or certain people in NFT space um, get to see what they're really like. And hopefully, everybody who comes on is feels open and able to talk about anything. Uh, hopefully, share some things that people have never heard. And just I think anything with a podcast and is just hopefully connecting with as many people as possible. So this is fun. This will be a lot of fun. And yeah, I think what's cool too here is that obviously Vernon knows sports from being somebody that actually had the athleticism and the work ethic to do it. I know sports from the perspective of being an absolute fanatic for most of my life and now being in the industry as an agent for a while. And then on the NFT side, we kind of swap roles where I'm a little bit more of the expert in the NFT space, just given my background of almost 10 years in crypto but Vernon, he's a collector at heart too. He's a D-Gen too. And so I kind of like the balance between the two of us. And I think it's going to be interesting for everybody to kind of hear our different perspectives and our different backgrounds. But I really do find it complimentary. So I'm excited. Um, before we bring I on... Cut, I think you're cutting yourself You're cutting yourself a little short when you said mm-hmm. between the two okay. of us. Uh, okay. When it comes to NFTs, like you are further, much further ahead than I am. So there's, it's, if let's say I, you, I was an athlete... And compared to maybe you not being as much of an athlete, it's still a stark difference between your NFT knowledge and mine. So well, I'm here to be, learn as well as everyone else. That's got to be one of the nicest things anybody's ever said to me. So I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I think this is, I'll also take this as an opportunity to make sure that we are acknowledging the gap in athleticism. Your background, mine's plain, boring, white. I will fix that. Your background, I see gold gloves. I see, I think that's a silver slugger. Um, I do want to emphasize for those that are maybe on the younger side, you know, Vernon, I'm 35. He's in the sweet spot of my sports fandom. Uh, Anybody my age that's a true sports fan knows what kind of player Vernon was as an all-star gold glover, silver uh, slugger. Um, But I mean, that, that background, you're just kind of stunning on me a little bit. Can give everybody two seconds, see some alcohol too, for a nice, a nice touch too. I think that's alcohol. Well, alcohol and sports. I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, (laughs) Yeah, two of two of my gold gloves are back there. I have another oh, yeah, one. Yeah, one more, right? Yeah, not to not to brag, but yeah, I got a third. It's at it's at the Arlington Hall of Fame right now for a year. Yeah. So I only got two on display for now. Yeah, Silver Slugger. Um and they actually misspelled and left some letters off my plaque on there, but whatever. It's still a silver bat. And then the alcohol, yeah. Some of my a couple of my brands that we that started since I got done playing, and then obviously family. Wife with the president and the kids at the home run derby that lasted uh, probably a total of a minute. So, 
Yeah. Hey, at least, got, at least you got there. I know it wasn't yeah, your best going, there. but better off in the real games. Yes. All right, here's a good example of where Brandon needs to do his work. <laughs> I'm going to go into airplane mode for a minute, though. So we don't, Brandon, cut that or keep it. I kind of like the raw footage too, so that's fine too. We'll see how that goes. Um, so let's uh, let's jam for a minute or two before we bring our inaugural guest. Uh, NBA draft. Were you dialed in at all? Did you track that at all? A little bit. Um, it's it seemed like an odd draft to me. Like I think you have like a lot of speculation. Like you don't know who's going to be what. Um, and since my my oldest goes to Baylor um, and he's one of the basketball managers. It was interesting to see Jeremy Sohan go ninth overall. Um, he didn't even start at Baylor, and that's Ooh. that shows just kind of what what the NBA draft was all about. It's predicting mm -hmm. and trying to figure out what guys are going to be. Like it wasn't one of those drafts where you're like, <clears throat> "This is going to be a superstar." Um, I mean, I guess this speculation around Chet Holmgren, but you never know. Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I was a little bit more tuned in to college basketball this year than other years just because we had the good fortune of, of collaborating and working with Jalen Duran, who uh, ended up being a lottery pick at 13. We worked with him on the NIL side of things. But once he went pro, obviously Vader Sports is not in the NBA. We don't represent NBA players. And so I was definitely rooting for Jalen. There was that fun moment for a minute, the Knicks fan of me, where the Knicks actually selected Jalen, but that was all part of a bunch of other moves. And, you know, I think I'll, I'll speak to it from a Knicks fan perspective because I am a uh, unapologetic Knicks fan there's some dissatisfaction I think out there um, from fans. Cause you know, we had this lottery pick and we ended up not actually coming away with a player. We did a whole assortment of things that was kind of hard to follow, frankly, for most myself included, but it kind of ended up where, you know, they, um, that franchise went ahead and picked up some extra picks in the future and then did some maneuvering around the salary cap. So I think for those that are judging the move now, it's an incomplete, right? We got to see what the Knicks do with that cap space, what the Knicks do with these future picks. Mm -hmm. um, future picks can be awfully valuable. Now I understand they're pretty heavily protective across the board, but um, I think the Knicks, the one thing I'll say about this Knicks regime versus previous regimes that I'm pretty happy with just the overall display of patience. I think a lot of times the Knicks franchise has kind of succumbed to the pressures of being in the big apple and, how good those Knicks teams were when I were little. And so we'll see. I'm optimistic. There's still some good pieces on this team. Obviously last year was disappointing compared to the previous year. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point with, uh, with Jeremy going ninth, that was always fascinating to me when you saw a bench player going top 10 and it just comes down to, you know, the, the height, weight, length, raw skills. And, yeah. you know, basketball certainly is that way. And when you think of some of the best picks, like, Giannis is such a great example. When Giannis mm -hmm. was drafted by the Bucks, he was basically skin and bones and was like a baby giraffe still trying to figure out his body. But watching him fill out, watching him, you know, develop an NBA body and an NBA skill set, he's now obviously one of the most dominant players in the league. And so I think in other sports, you don't really see that type of production or the lack of production get drafted so high. But I think basketball makes a lot of sense. These kids are also getting drafted younger. You know, I'll speak yeah. to football the most because that's where my expertise is the heaviest as an agent. You know, I'd be curious with, to see what the NFL draft looked like if um, if kids could be drafted after their freshman year of, of college football, right? Because in the NFL, you got to be three years yeah. removed, whereas basketball is a year. So I think it would they're, look not a lot they're not physically ready. Like you just exactly. get – they're going up against grown men when it comes to that. So, yeah, it's safety-wise – kids need to develop but since you right. watch a lot of college basketball this year how does duke have that many kids go that high in the draft and not win at all sometimes it just comes down to chemistry and putting it together um sometimes the ball doesn't bounce your way you know like yeah say with baseball right you you know you could have the most stacked uh didn't the yankees just get no hit yes. right didn't that just happen aren't they yeah. correct me if I'm wrong are they the best team in baseball right now or close to it yeah Something you know, and the the tournament's one and done, right? You you lose and you're out. And so I think it's just um, I think there's an element of luck that just exists in life and in sports. And yeah, they had a ton of talent, no question. They always do, but sometimes it comes down to chemistry because that's the other thing with one and done teams, right? You don't really get a right. whole lot of time to build that chemistry, yeah. and sometimes the ball just doesn't bounce in. That's how I see yeah. it. 
which I wonder if that's, I mean, it's hard to take that away from, from kids just understanding going, have to going for one year, but it's like you college programs can't really build what they're used to building when it's, yeah. when it's this, this style. So I mean, I think, obviously you don't want, you don't want to take that money out of kids' hands at that early of an age. Right. Yeah. Although NIL helps where kids can yeah. actually make a lot of money while they're at, uh, in college. So I think that's cool. Uh, well, if should, we're doing it, if we're, if we're doing it, they make a lot of money. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, shifting gears quickly. Again, we got our guests teed up and ready to roll. Um, NFT NYC. Did you, you know, obviously, as far as I know, you didn't go. I think you would have told me if you were going. Uh, yeah. Did you catch anything? I, I was in attendance for about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I caught the first half of the week. Did you happen to just see any buzz around it, you know, given the DGEN behavior or, or should I fill you oh, in? Yeah. Some? yeah. I mean, buzz is everywhere. Uh, Twitter feeds blowing up about stuff going on. We were, my wife and I actually did fly to New York, um, but we went to go see a play. But walking around, you just see NFT NYC everywhere. Um, yeah. And it's, it's fun when you're trying to learn, uh, learn about this area of things. And it's, it kind of hits you in the face when you're in New York, New York, and that's, it's everywhere. Right. So it's real. I think that's, that's kind of the thing that people, people just getting into the space. It's like, oh, there's no doubt it's real. It's just a matter of educating yourself on what it actually is. Yeah, I think I was really pleased. Like I said, I was there Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It was in my backyard. I live locally. And, uh, you know, went to a few different events. Uh, Vayner Sports Pass, we had our own event Monday night. And then uh, went to Ape Fest for a day. And then some of the Wolf Game uh, meetups, both the Fest and the Feast. And I thought what was cool and I was uncertain about was obviously crypto as a whole and the NFT industry as a whole has struggled here the last like two months or so. But I think the the consistent theme was just a overall belief in the big picture and understanding that, you know, markets can be volatile. There's going to be ups and downs and, and it's going to ebb and flow. But overall, the conviction that I felt, I think people kind of stomach the blow. It hurt. Most people got hurt by this drop. But again, it was just a great opportunity to get people together in person, um, get people together that are like-minded and interested in the similar projects. And I just thought the energy overall was great. And it's just awesome meeting people in real life. You know, for me, I got, there's probably two or three communities that I'm a part of that if somebody tells me their, their handle on discord or Twitter, I'll know it. Uh, Vayner sports pass for sure. It was so great at our party. People telling me their, their handle on discord and me knowing right away and talking to them. Uh, another one was Wolf Game. Um, I was, I've been and have been very dialed in, and obviously be friends. And so it was just really cool meeting people that you've conversated with and you've gotten to know mm -hmm. their online persona, and then actually, you know, have a conversation, share a drink, spend time in person. You know, as much as the pandemic has taught us how to use Zoom and things of that nature, nothing beats that in person time. So that that was the highlight for me for yeah. NYC for sure. Which I think is unique about just the community side of things. Like you, you build relationships and you meet new people, and it's that's something that I think obviously will continue to grow over time. But it's it's something that we need as as a society to be able to communicate with people that have like minds and are are striving to do big things in a certain space, whatever that may be. Um, and it seems like everybody's in it to grow it and obviously kill it in whatever they're doing. No doubt. Exciting times. All right. I think we're good to go. Um, let's bring on our first ever guest to Going Deep. Um, I think this just, he was so fitting. He was the first name that the two of you or two of us came up with. Um, this is somebody that is a tremendous athlete and should have some great stories to tell, but is also a proper DJ in the NFT space. Um, our good friend, Justin Turner is on the show. There he is. JT. What's up guys? What's up, man? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? Good, man. What do you think about Vernon's background? Uh, yeah, you actually kind of stole my thunder. I was, I was in the little waiting room and I'm looking at this and I look to my right and I see Vernon's background. I look to my left. And I'm like, man, I got to send AJ some art or something. Oh yeah. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great blank. I've got, I've got some stuff. It's a, it's a topic amongst the team internally. My background will be updated um, probably in the next couple of weeks. So I'll have something. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty. I mean, I got the white tee to boot. I'm as yeah, I'm as vanilla as it gets right now. But Vernon, that's that's next level right there. That's, I mean, it, it's not a surprise at all. That's pro background, and 
<laughs> it doesn't surprise me that that. that well, I, I started. I, I started to try to decorate it on my own, and my wife comes in. She's like, uh, "No, you're not doing a very good job." So yeah. obviously, this is this is not my doing. <laughs> you you were half of it. You earned it. Yeah. Right. And she she made it look good. Well, I don't know. You can you got to ask her that question whether I earned it or not. <laughs> <laughs> JT, where are you at right now? On the road? Yeah, we're in Denver. We're yeah. in Denver, so we got three games here, and we're in the front end of a 20 games in 20 days with some brutal travel so um and playing in denver is basically like playing on the moon so uh you know try to get through this one and be whole as a as a team i think that's the goal <laughs> 20 games in it's 20 interesting. Games. you talk about talk about denver and this is completely i mean obviously it's part of the baseball subject but i would tell people like they would ask me about hitting it and hitting in that ballpark. And I'm like, it's different. Like everything is different. Everything plays differently. Like for me, it seemed like curveballs would turn into sliders, sliders would turn into cutters. And what you're used to seeing visually is not the same as what takes place on that field. It takes a little while to adjust. Did you, you see that? Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's weird. The characteristics and obviously now there's so much more data that supports it. Um, but everything goes right and left less but goes up and down more here so you're seeing the breaking balls that normally are sweeping across the plate are kind of you know shorter downers and and like you said the sliders are just kind of like spinning and backing up and um that's why most of the time the guys that have the most success here are more fastball change up oriented because they don't have to rely on their spin which isn't doing what it normally does and then you know hitting here is great uh when you stand in the batter's box, there's there's some places where you stand in the box and you can see all seven defenders, you know, in your peripheral. And it looks like there's no hits out there. And this is not one of them. You're in That's the box. You can barely see the shortstop. You can barely. See, well, now the second baseman's up playing right behind the pitcher. So you can see the second baseman, barely see the shortstop and the center fielder. And it looks like no matter what you do, you're going to get a hit. All you got to do is move the ball forward. And uh, it's so big and the ball does fly here. So. You know, just like you said, curveballs turn into sliders and sliders turn into cutters, singles turn into doubles, doubles turn into triples. Yeah. And if you get the ball in the air high enough, uh, you know, usually it's a homer. So it's it's an interesting place, but it does take a toll on your body playing in the altitude. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's tough. And easy on the triples, easy on the triples. Like <laughs> I, I, you can't lead the league in hitting, you can't lead the league in doubles if you're hitting triples. Exactly. And if you hit a triple in your, you hit a triple in your first at bat, you might be done for the rest of the game. Like, oh, please. yeah, especially especially yeah. here. I mean, there's a reason yeah. there's there's oxygen tanks and those HTO little canisters that you can get at 7-Eleven. They're all over the dugout. Guys are hitting it in between innings trying to, you know, just be able to breathe. It's, it's crazy. It's it's crazy how different it is. I mean, people think it's kind of like mental and it's not that big a deal. But I mean, it's a it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. That's dope. What up, uh, JT? Just to ground our audience a bit we kind of jumped right into it can you give everybody just like two minutes on who you are you know not just as a baseball player but just who you are as a man yeah um you know i grew up in southern california um born and raised in long beach california uh went to cal state fullerton for four years of college uh got drafted my senior year by the cincinnati reds um and then i went on a pretty wild journey uh to get to where i am today i uh, was traded by the Reds in 2008 for Ramon Hernandez and then uh, got to the Orioles. The Orioles designated me for assignment, which basically means uh, they needed room on their 40-man roster. So they took me off the roster and uh, I had to go through waivers where the New York Mets claimed me. Um, spent four years with the Mets and right before being tendered my first arbitration contract uh they decided they needed a roster spot again and i was non-tendered um let go became a free agent and then uh signed with the dodgers which was i guess a, a turning point a key point in my career because ever since then uh i turned the corner and and you know things kind of took off for me so um been through a lot uh been through just about everything you can go through as a baseball player except for getting flat out released, which, you know, hopefully I can avoid that one and, and, and go out on my own terms. But, um, 
it's been good for me because I've, I've been through a lot of things. Uh, I was a utility infielder for five years when I first broke into the league. Um, you know, just pinch hitting, coming off the bench, giving guys days off all around the infield. Uh, and then when I got to the Dodgers, you know, settled into an everyday role playing third base. I've made a couple all-star teams. So I feel like I have a, a unique experience and background and being able to connect with every guy that comes into our clubhouse. And, and as a leader in there and, and an older guy, I think that's important, like being able to understand what guys are going through, being able to understand how hard it is to pinch hit or how hard it is to play once a week or how hard it is to play every day. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for for the path that, that I took, even though, you know, it wasn't the sexy one, um, because I think it's made me such a better person in understanding, you know, what everyone else is going through. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I I respect most about you. Like you hit a point where you kind of had to reinvent yourself. And I know the work that you put into it. I know the changes that you made. And I think as as an athlete or as a human being, it's like you want to be rewarded for the work that you put in. Um, and this is just the things you had to go through to get to that point. And like you said, not, you can relate to everyone, everyone who's played the game that has struggled, that has had success, um, that had to work for everything they could get. And you've done that and, and immensely more, which I love that about you. That's if when you're telling baseball stories, um, it's people like you, uh, that, that make this game great. And it's been awesome to watch, man. Well, I appreciate it. I obviously love watching you. And I, I remember, uh, one of our last trips to to Toronto, I think some of the boys were, went to dinner or something. We're walking down the street, and and you came rolling by in your car, and you took the time to stop and and talk. Do you remember this in Toronto? Oh yeah, I remember. Out yeah. of the road, and I remember. Shit, like Vernon just pulled over, literally to just you know shoot the shit with us and say what's up. Like I thought that was I thought that was so cool, right in the middle of downtown Toronto. <laughs> well, I think that that's probably that's something that we we both have in common. It's like we just play a game, like we play a game for a living. Like it doesn't make us any different than anybody else. It's and you enjoy it. Um, hopefully, blessed because of it. But like, yeah, be real. Like you, this game in this game, we we know who is and who isn't. Like it, it you you understand kind of. Okay, I like I like this dude. Um, and then yeah. some of them, like I have, I don't want anything to do with this guy. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're not one of those people. <laughs> yeah. You learn real quick. Uh, oh yeah. You, know, you learn real quick about who people are and, and what they're made of and, and their character. And, and that's the thing about this game is, is you fail so much you're supposed to fail. So it, it literally reveals a person's character immediately because you know, you're going to get your ass kicked and uh, it's going to be tough and you're going to struggle and you're going to be, feeling like you completely forgot how to play the game of baseball, the game that you played your whole life. And that's when, you know, you have to decide, okay, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to move forward? Am I going to feel sorry for myself and pout and look for other people to come over and, and try to console me? Or am I going to, you know, show up and go to work and, and grind my butt off and try to figure out how to get out of this. And, you know, the guys that choose the latter, I have the utmost respect for. It's funny. I use baseball a lot as an analogy when I talk to people about venture capital because those are two businesses that at least are top of the purview for me that blow my mind, JT, to borrow what you were saying. It's insane that when you think about baseball as a profession, strictly speaking about the hitting portion, which both of you obviously have done very well in your careers, that the greatest to ever do it failed seven out of ten times, right? You bat 300, you're a Hall of Famer. If you can bat 300 over a 10-plus year period – in venture capital, when I use that analogy, it's it's even more extreme. If you can go one for 10 in venture, just given kind of the dynamics of if you get an investment right, I'm, I'm mainly speaking about like seed stage investing. If you're early, you go one for 10 and you're winning and you're one of the greatest of all time. It's just like, it is an interesting mentality, but you know, I can assume from knowing baseball players and working with them. And then I know as a venture capitalist, it's really fascinating when you work in an industry where um, – one, you being right one or three out of 10 times is, is fantastic. And then two, another analogy is it's a home run based business, right? You hit homers versus hitting singles. Same thing with venture. If you hit a homer in venture, it can 
take care of a lot of mistakes made along the way. So it's just an interesting mentality that I wanted people to hear here is just, I don't know, just, I always found it fascinating and, and I'm glad to kind of hear the insight you were just given because I hadn't really heard it articulated that way. I got a question for you on that, on venture. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, one out of 10 and, and you're living large, right? You're, you're doing it. So what is your strategy going into that stuff? Is it throw as many lines in the water as you can, or is it still educated guesses? Because at the seed rounds, it's so early, it's so hard to know. Everything's a gamble, right? So yeah. uh, are you just betting on people at that point? Or or what is what are your yeah to say, I'm, I'm going to roll the dice on this one? Yeah, so it, it's shifted for me. Um, there's a very big difference in investing when you're using your own money and you're writing small checks versus you're using somebody else's money. You're investing on behalf of somebody, right? Gary and I have a fund in which we have an LP. So just that responsibility, that in general has always been fascinating for me, even as an agent, right? Like I, uh, I had a couple clients on the football side that were marquee free agents on the football side. And uh, back a few months ago, I felt so much more pressure when I was working on DJ Reed's contract or Foye Luakun's contract because any misstep I would make would be costing them millions. I'm okay with costing me millions. I really struggle with costing somebody else millions, right? And so there, there is a stark contrast between you being an angel investor and writing $25,000 checks personally versus writing checks on behalf of our LP for a million or two. I'll answer it from me as an individual um, back when you know I had some of my best investments. I think the key word that I look for because not only am I, as an angel investor, trying to hit a home run, I'm trying to hit like a 600-foot grand slam because that's where you can really win, right? I, I was very fortunate to have done a um, an investment in Uber fairly early, um, their Series B round. And I did that as an individual. I did that back in 2010. I was 23 years old. And so for Uber, um, it checked both the boxes off for me. I have two very key categories, and they both center around disruption. And it's a disruptive entrepreneur, a disruptive thinker, somebody that wants to challenge the status quo and really push the envelope, and then a disruptive idea. Now, where you can get in trouble, and I have gotten in trouble before, is being so in love with the disruptive idea and chasing that because you, especially me as an operator, I'm an operator first and investor second. I hear this idea and I instantly go into like my own mode of how I can make that successful but then ultimately the entrepreneur that you bet on doesn't make it come to life and you lose. So I'm operator first, founder first, idea second. I really, really tend to like having both. And then to the question you asked before, um, I think it's very personal. It depends on your personality. It depends on your bankroll. I, um, it also depends on intuition. So I started investing in 2010, which was like a few years into like that Web 2.0 push. And I did go a little bit more. It's a commonly used term spray and pray where you're putting a bunch of investments out. I did do a little bit more spray and pray than I do now or typically would or would now because I felt like it was just such a revolutionary moment in time that there was going to be so many winners. And I didn't want to be over, over like, what's the right word? I didn't want to overly censor my belief in the momentum of the general industry. That's kind of how I felt with Web3 last year too. And we did as a fund, I think, invest a lot early and often because we saw it in Web2 that there were so many winners in 07, 08, 09, 10, and 11. And then honestly, the winners started to dry up. And so I think the same thing could happen in Web3. Now there's always going to be winners, but there was a moment in time, like for me, I was very lucky two of my first five investments were Uber Series B and Venmo Seed Round in my life mm. at 23 years old. And there isn't a lot of 2010s out there, at least in the areas in which my brother Gary and I are most strong, right? There's plenty of great winners in companies and industries that I don't understand as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. But it, mm. the way I kind of explain it, I'll, I'll summarize it with this. And you can look at Uber this way. Imagine if in baseball – you're down 8-1 in the ninth, and there actually was like a video game style eight-run home run Yeah, that was 600 feet away. That's what Uber was for me, and that's a possible adventure, which is obviously not possible in baseball. So, 
that's an interesting yeah. dynamic. AJ, you bring up a, I mean, you said one for 10 and basically it's Homer or, or punch out. Like mm-hmm. it's, that's what it is. And back to baseball, JT, like in the game now, how much it's changed, obviously since the time you started to the, to where you are now and the philosophies and, and the thought process has changed in so many different areas, but your, your strikeout numbers remain down. Um, why have you chosen to stick with what you do as opposed to changing to the way what the game is trying to get to? Because I still hate striking out as much as I ever mm-hmm. do. Yep. And it's, it's that simple. Like I, I don't enjoy striking out and it's not like, Oh, I put this ball in play, but if I would have swung as hard as I could, I would have hit a homer on that. So I'm okay. Right. With, like, I don't, I don't, I don't like that. I, I want to put a ball in play and give myself a chance to get on base. And I think that's, exactly. I think that's winning baseball uh, yeah. when guys are, are doing that. And, and, you know, there's sometimes um, where I think a strikeout is okay. I, there's sometimes where, you know, first and second with no outs in the ninth inning and you're down two runs, like I'm okay striking out rather than hitting into a double play. Right. right? Like there, there are some situations where I'm not going to, you know, choke down and, and just try to mm-hmm. put it in play because that might actually, you know, hurt our team rather than help us. I'd rather, you know, still try to drive a ball in the gap. And if I strike out, then so be it. But the last thing I want to do is hit a, a ground ball and end the game or yeah. ninth inning one out. You hit a ground ball, the game's over. Yeah. Especially when you run like me, if you hit a ground ball, the game's over. <laughs> so, so there are times where I think, you know, it's okay, but that's very rare and, and not the goal. And um, I still get pissed when I strike out. Yeah. And certainly not 200 times a year. No, like no. that's amazing to me. Yeah, that like that's that, that's over that's over two seasons worth of punch outs, like in in one season. Like I don't get it, but whatever. Yeah, it's it's wild. I mean, I think the game. It's funny watching the trends of baseball, right? And and where it's going. A few years ago, it was the three true outcomes, right? Like uh, walks, strikeouts, homers, and you know everyone's you know swinging out of their out of their cornhole trying to go deep and it didn't matter mm-hmm. if you struck out and these guys were getting paid. And then, you know, now with all the stuff that's going on with the baseballs, like, are they dead? Are they not dead? Are they too slick? What, like what's going right. on? Homers are way down. So now you're seeing, and I know in our organization, you're seeing people start to value bat to ball skills and being able to move the ball forward. And I know our hitting guys for a fact will take, a guy that has hand-eye bat-to-ball skills and try to help him retool his swing to produce more power and to hit more doubles and homers. Mm -hmm. But the -the bat-to-ball is never going to leave. Now you take the guys who have swing and miss their entire career and you try to tweak their swing, historically, the swing and miss is always going to be there. You can't go backwards on that. So when – I see all these videos on Instagram and, and social media of guys hitting and trying to teach this a swing, you know, power swing, teaching eight year olds how to hit homers. And I get questions from friends and people about their kids and what they should be doing. I'm literally like, save your money and mm-hmm. just get your kid to put the ball in play every time. Yeah. Like they're 10 years old. It doesn't matter if he hits 10 homers at 10 years old, who cares? Like teach him to put the bat on the ball. And then as you get older and you go into your body and, and you get more coordinated and, and you fill out, like now you have the bat to ball and we can start working on a better swing path or a better body, body position to try to produce more damage. But you're not going to lose that bat to ball that you developed your whole life if you work on it from the time you're a young kid. Amen. That makes a ton of sense. JT, to that point, um when we first met or at least the first time we got a chance to really chop it up i asked you the same question and i don't remember all the details because i have a terrible memory but i remember some new york to la and just that that next level step you took to becoming this all-star player after what the first part of your career looked like i remember you telling me there was a, a maybe maybe it was a teammate i'm trying to remember the exact details but there was something in particular that kind of was like the foundation for what you were able to build off. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so in 2013, I was with the Mets, and we signed Marlon Bird as a free agent. That's what it was. Yep. And uh, Marlon came in. And he looked like a completely different hitter than the Marlon Bird I had seen with the Cubs and the Rangers. He was leg kicking uh, and he was just hitting balls so far and uh, sitting around and having conversations because in baseball and Vernon can tell you there's a lot of dead time and there's a lot of time around the cage and there's a lot of time in the clubhouse where you just have conversations about, you know, hitting and experience and thoughts and feels you know, Marlon started going off on his this new swing thought that he had about, you know, um, working inside and 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 maintaining a, a line and letting the barrel work underneath his hands and and trying to elevate the ball more. And that kind of went against everything that I'd always believed in my entire career. I was always like a stay back guy, stay inside the ball, hit low line drives the other way. I didn't hit for a lot of power. And, uh, you know, throughout the course of the season, he was on me every day talking about it, talking about it. And some of the things just started to make sense. And in September, I finally caved into him. I was like, all right, like, let's go. Like, talk to me about what you want to talk to me about. Let's take some swings and, and try to figure this out. And I remember my first series doing this, we went to Cleveland. I had zero homers on the year. So this is in September. Went to Cleveland, and uh, the second game there, I was facing Cody Allen, who was like an all-star closer at the time, throwing 98. And I hit a homer over the over the trees in center. It was the furthest ball I've ever hit in my life. And I'm like, oh wow, like I don't I don't even know how that happened. Like that felt good. Next day, come in uh, facing Salazar, who's also throwing 98, and I hit a ball three quarters of the way up the stands in left center. And I'm like, oh my god. Like, this is great. Like, I've never felt this in my life. I've never felt, like, dangerous. Like, I always thought I was a good hitter. Mm -hmm. I always thought I can put together good ABs and foul off pitches and hit the ball the other way. But I've never been able to, like, figure out how to drive the ball in the air to left center on the pull side. And um, so kept going, kept working with them or talking to them and, uh, you know, had a great September. Uh, and when I got home, uh, it just so happened that the guy he was hitting with was out of Northridge. His name's Doug Lotta. And so I said, Hey, I need Doug's number. I, I, I want more of this. Like I was so like obsessed. Yeah, of course. Feeling I was like, I like, I felt like I unlocked Pandora's box. Right. Like, I'm like, Holy crap. Like, this is what, this is what Vernon feels like when he plays <laughs> baseball. Like, damn. So uh, spent the whole off season uh, five days a week, three two three hours a day uh hitting with doug and really just trying to figure out how to get my body in a good position and really start to understand the swing and the mechanics of the swing and what was right and what was wrong and really the feel versus real and i mean vernon you know about the feel versus real as hitters you know, a lot of times we feel like we're doing one thing, but then if you go look at the film, it looks completely different. So uh, figuring out ways to trick your mind into doing <clears throat> your body, do what you want it to do. And some, some guys mm -hmm. feel like they have to swing straight down. Some guys feel like they have to swing up, but the goal is to swing on plane and be in the zone for as long as you possibly can, which is, which is mind blowing when I hear all these guys talking and you see, you see these guys on Twitter, these Jeff fries and these hitmen yeah. go at it. And, you know, Jerry Harrison jr. Is big in this, like, mm. you know, fighting <laughs> with these hitting guys about, Oh, the swing and swinging down. And it's like, guys, it's not about swinging up or down. It's different for every single hitter. You got to feel what you got to feel to be in the zone for as long as you can. That's, that's the main goal. And a lot of people don't understand that, but anyways, yeah, that, that was, uh, Marlon Bird staying on me and, and hounding me about, you know, changing the way my thought process of hitting um, really led to be awesome. Around. Love that, man. What uh, let's shift gears for a minute. Tell this, uh, tell the crew listening, because for the most part, everybody listening is a DJ in the NFT space. Talk a little bit about, you know, your NFT journey. What got you started? What kept you interested? I mean, I obviously know some of the answers here and my brother and I play some of that role, but you know, we talk, we have a lot of athletes, right? And we have a lot of athletes. We talk to a lot of athletes, but you're one of the ones that stick out at the tippy top as somebody that really embraced it and kept going. And 
I think about everybody that's texting me questions and things of that nature. You're at the top of that list. So what draws you to NFTs? Why do you like them? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I, last year, beginning of 21, I didn't know anything about NFTs. I couldn't tell you what NFT stood for. Um, and we actually got out to spring training and I had had a couple conversations with Micah Johnson, who I'm good friends with, played with the Dodgers. And um, he started kind of telling me about, you know, these couple artists that he had been working with. And this, uh, it was actually a a Harold Varner NFT that had been released, a dollar bill with like a golf course painted on it. And he's like, man, you like should think about doing this. And I'm just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then your brother called me and said, hey, uh, you need to buy a crypto punk and i said what the hell's a crypto punk (laughs) and he's like this this is what you need to do he's like you need to create a coin by coinbase account then create a metamask wallet and then get your seed phrase and transfer money in and go buy this crypto punk and at the time i think cryptos crypto punks were like fifteen thousand sixteen thousand dollars um what eth was at the time but yeah around yep I was like, all right. And it took me a couple of days to figure out how to set up my Coinbase, how to set up my MetaMask, like get all that thing, all that stuff dialed in. And then finally I, I transferred, I remember I transferred $25,000 into my Coinbase. Um, what I didn't know was at the time, it took seven days for that money to clear for me to be able to convert it to ETH and put it into my wallet. So I waited seven days, seven days go by. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to go buy this punk. <laughs> log on go go on check out the punks and the floor by the time i had my money transferred over it was like thirty two thousand. right i'm like shit i got 25k in eth i can't even afford this punk i'm like all right i'm gonna put another twenty five thousand. gary really wants me to get this punk i'm gonna put another twenty five thousand. i'm gonna get this punk so i wait another seven days for that twenty five thousand to clear and by that time the floor was like 62 grand. So I missed both, both opportunities to get my punk because the floor just yep. was on an elevator, right? Just <laughs> going to the roof. And I'm like, holy shit. I have $50,000 in ETH and I, I can't even buy what I went out here to buy. Like what am I going to do? Right. And so yeah. at this point, I know Gary had been talking about having his project come out and, and whatever, but uh, there was some buzz going around about, you know, bored apes. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll buy a couple bored apes. So I, I ended up buying, uh, I bought two bored apes and I knew nothing about it. I knew nothing about rarity tools or how to rate them or, or what was special and what was not. And one of my apes was a death bot. And I'm trying to like, learn the space and understand it more. And, you know, I'm listening to, uh, you know, you guys talk on Twitter and in your different things about, you know, you just got to try stuff. You got to get on there and you got to experience it and fail. And so I was like, all right, I have this ape, like the floor's going up. Like I'm going to try to list this bot, this death bot for 23 ETH. I'm like, that's crazy. I bought it for like seven. I'm like, no one's going to, no one's going to buy it. It sold in like 15 seconds and my Twitter starts getting blown up. Like, oh my God, super steel death bot goes for 23. And I'm like, what are these people talking about? And then I literally like, I don't know if I, maybe I text you or your your brother and I'm like, what is this? What is this? How do I find out the floor for these apes? And you're like, rarity tools. And I go on and the floor for a death bot was like 30 ETH. So I I was like, oh my God, what do I do? (laughs) Hey, I, I messed up so bad. And I, I, I was like, ah, like great lesson though. Brain fry. But with that 23 ETH, I went back and I bought two more apes. So I ended up having three board apes and I still own all three of them. That's what's up. And it ended up working out because uh, I had three apes. I had three mutants. I had three kennel clubs. Right. And that's kind of my, sh- my long story of my lessons in NFT right that's there. What one, man? Hey, <laughs> man, you picked up some V friends along the way. And then, and then V friends dropped and Gary was like, go get these, man. Like, and I'm like, all right. So I'm like, bye, 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 bye. And, uh, yeah, I, I held on to those and, 
that all worked out great. Obviously, um, I have a gift goat. Yeah. Uh, so that's probably the closest thing to in real life experiences I've had so far with NFTs because I'm getting all these gifts delivered for owning a gift goat. Right. Um, just pretty cool. I haven't had a chance to go to any of these NYC Fest, Ape right. Fest in, in Miami or New York, obviously. But I am excited about the Vayner Sports Pass opportunities to, um, you know, hopefully participate in some cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, do some in real life stuff with that. Oh, yeah. We'll definitely do something there. No, that, that's all. JT, awesome. yeah. JT, you did, you, did the, you did the right thing because I didn't listen for a while like because i didn't know what the hell they were talking about i'm like this doesn't even make any damn sense but whatever and now i realize i will listen to absolutely everything that comes out of these two their two mouths and i will do it and i won't ask questions like it's it's gonna get done yeah be careful though because i might fuck with you at some point just that's fine that's off the wall shit well it's funny when yeah when aj was talking about you know giving advice earlier and doing like nil deals and and dealing with other people's money and being mm-hmm. nervous about that like so because i was you know doing this stuff and i got in early even though i didn't really know what the hell i was doing i had some baseball guys like coming to me asking for nft advice and i'm like guys like <laughs> i like this is this these are big investments like i don't know if i'm comfortable gambling i'll tell you what i'm gonna do and what I'm doing, but I'm not going to tell you to do anything because yeah. like, I don't want to mess with your money and then have you coming to me like, what the hell? You told me to get a pudgy yeah. penguin and, and it went to zero or whatever, you know, whatever the project is. And I'm like, man, this is crazy. And we literally have like a group chat with a bunch of guys, a bunch of baseball guys some football guys like Golden Tate's in the group chat. Um, some hockey guys are in there and it's constant like, oh, check out this project, this project, this project, this project. And it's it's crazy. Some guys have, have recommended some stuff that haven't worked out. And right. there's some, there's a little bit of like tension, like, yeah. oh, like, okay, who do we listen to? Can we listen to this? Can we listen to that? So uh, it's, it's obviously a, it's a scary thing. It's easy when you're doing it. Like you said, it's easy when you're doing it with your own money. Uh, it's harder when you're trying to make suggestions for. for yeah. Money. I mean, I deal with that a lot. Right. And in the sense that obviously Gary and I are so deep in this space, we're so public about it, Gary in particular, me more so now. And uh, <clears throat> what I've actually found myself having to do, you know, obviously it's, it's interesting. I've seen it time and time again, greater society and athletes as well. Like when things are going really well is when you hear the most about it. Um, and so you know, last year during the big pop and then earlier this year during another pop, I've actually found myself, one, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not registered as a financial advisor. I can't provide financial advice and I'm an agent in baseball and football. And so that, you know, I'm constantly telling people, hey, this is not financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. You need to talk to your financial advisor. Probably the number one thing I do is like when guys help me, like, hey, I'm going to buy this thing. I'm like, have you talked to your financial advisor about it? Like what percentage of your money are you actually putting towards this stuff? Because, and honestly, I'm, I'm in a weird way. I'm glad what's happened over the last couple of months has happened because I feel like it's human nature to just get into like this delusional belief that things are going to continue to go up and things are going to continue to go well. While all the information, all the data of every market ever proves that things go up and down. And so I've had to talk guys out being like, Hey, like you're a, a late round NFL draft pick. Keep in mind taxes. So whatever you got for your signing bonus, that's more like 40 to 50% of that's going to the government. And you want to spend $50,000 on this digital picture. And I believe in it, but like, there's nothing to say that this $50,000 picture is not going to be worth $5,000 two months from now. That's exactly what just happened. And so it's definitely scary um, in my shoes because I'm obviously a trusted partner for all our athletes. And it's just so easy for guys to get caught up in the clubhouse or the locker room and see Oh, that guy turned ten grand into a hundred. So can I? Da da da. And it's uh, it, that's an easy way to lose when you think that way. Well, I think that's kind of the great thing, or the good thing that's coming out of this. You know, obviously dip here is it turned into, which is a good thing because floors were going through the roof and everyone was making money. But it, I feel like it turned into such like a NFT was such a buzzword where everyone saw it as an opportunity to get rich. Yep. Right? And I feel like it took away a lot from creators and their projects. And 
people were just so concerned with getting rich that they weren't paying attention to all the work that was being put into these projects and how much value was actually being created. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's good that anyone's losing money. I don't, I hate well, yeah, right. losing money, but I think it's a good thing that it's kind of filtering out the people that were just in it to make a buck and didn't really give a shit about the project. And then to piggyback off what you're saying, also the creators that didn't give a shit, right? What that, creator, yeah, oh, yeah. when There's everybody so made money, it was just like shitty projects were just being printed because you could print a project and make a million dollars. And so low effort, people that didn't care, really the antithesis of somebody like Micah was really populating. And now that we're in the downturn, it's just not that easy anymore. And thus people aren't doing it anymore. And I think the quality, it's going to separate the contenders and the pretenders is how I see it. Well, and you look what happened with, with Micah and that, that Accutar mint, right? Which was like, probably one of the most devastating things I've ever heard because I know how much time and effort and everything he put everything into it, but you see the value in the project when something like that happens, when he loses, what, what was the number? Uh, 32 I, million or something like that. $32 million of his money that he earned. Yeah. And you see the community rally around him and it's still going up, right? Like yep. that's, those are the projects that, you know, I want to be involved in, I want to be included in. And the funny thing you, you mentioned about the creators, you know, seeing a quick way to make a buck. I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and be like, why don't you make an NFT? Like you can make so much money. And I said, because I give a shit about my reputation and what people think about me. Like I'm not trying to steal money from people. And I know that NFT projects are a lot of work and a lot of time that yep. I personally don't have. Yep. <laughs> No, I, I love like what you're saying is music to my ears. And I've had to have a lot of conversations with our clients about that. And uh, if you look for the most part, I'm not going to say everybody, but if you look for the most part, the athlete puts in the time and the energy for the launch and yep. the money. And then it's kind of like, well, now what? And the athlete's like, well, I'm not really incentivized to do much more unless you care about your reputation. Yeah. And so um, I wish – most athletes thought that way, but I would say it's it's actually the opposite where most don't. Um, POAPs. Stick to POAPs, man. Yeah, man. POAPs. We're big fans <laughs> of POAP here. Um, what else? Trying to think through. This has been a lot of fun. Sports, NFTs. What's – um? all right. I got one for you because I love Vernon's version of this story. So I want to hear yours. You know, Vernon told this amazing story to me originally, and then I had him retell it on our Twitter space recently. Um, like what is your absolute highlight play, like crowning athletic achievement that you as an, forget the team perspective, obviously you're a world series champion. Let's put that aside. Like what is that singular moment where you were floating on cloud nine because of something you did, you know, Vernon hitting a walk off Mariano is batshit crazy to me. Um, that might be hard for you to top. So I apologize for setting you up, but uh, walk us through something that just like sticks and whether, by the way, it could be little league, pros, whatever, like what sticks out in your mind as like an unbelievable moment? Yeah, I definitely can't top a walk-off homer off of Mariano. So I'll, I'll one down him. I faced Mariano once in my life. I hit a 65 hopper up the middle for a hit. So I'm hitting a thousand. The best nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll one down you on that one. Less <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the Vayner sports family of Mariano. You think he was some yeah. little road reliever, not the greatest of all time. Yeah, he was unbelievable. Um, in the book, in the book, it actually could look like a line drive that almost took his head off and went to center field. Yeah, so it sounds you, no, it sounds you could tell me what you wanted to. Sixty-five hopper right back up the middle. And <laughs> I, I listened to your spaces this morning, and um, I was at a I was at breakfast actually, so it wasn't easy to hear. But I think you said like the trick off him was waiting for the ball to feel like it's going to hit you, and that's the one you want to swing at. Yeah, that was that was my approach. I'm like, all right, if it's gonna hit you, yeah. swing. <laughs> yeah, which makes no sense whatsoever. Yes. Well, it kind of is high upside though, because at the very least it's self-defense. Yeah. Yeah. So um no, but to answer your question for me, um the biggest swing I've ever taken in my life was was in the 2017 NLCS uh against the Cubs, John Lackey, uh walk off through on Homer. And it's it's like Vernon said, and because I, I did listen to that whole story, you you hit the ball, um, and you know you, you know you hit it good, but you're running down the line, and there's you know this doubt: is it going to go? Is it going to go? And then once it, 
you see it go over the fence, you just almost forget <laughs> what happens after that. And you do feel like you're floating. And one of the, I think one of the best descriptions I can give of Dodger stadium when you hit a walk-off Homer, uh, cause we have our one ear flap helmet, right. And there's a little hole in the left side. So as you're running and bouncing, the, the crowd noise is kind of going in and out. And I always tell people, I was like, think of Ace Ventura when he's on the balcony and he's opening the sliding door and closing the sliding door. Like oh, yeah. that's, that's what it feels like going in and out of your ear. Like you hear the roar and then it goes away when you, when your foot hits the ground and then you hear it and then it goes away. And it's like the weirdest feeling, the coolest feeling. And then obviously you hit their base and turn and you see mm-hmm. your entire team yeah, just that's... doing batshit crazy at home plate. And, oh, man, that's the only walk-off homer I've ever hit. Is and, that right? Yeah. And, it's a hell of a spot. It is. Yeah. It is an unbelievable feeling. What, uh, what game of the NLCS was that? Uh, what was it? Game two, I believe. Okay. That's awesome. And then the other cool part of, the, of this story was it was actually on the anniversary of Kirk Gibson's pinch hit. Really? Homer off the A's, off Eckersley. Um, so that happened on the same day. And when I got back in the clubhouse, I actually had a text from uh, from Gibby. That's was fucking badass. awesome. Badass. That's awesome. Okay. That's I, got, I, got, I got a World Series question. Game six in Arlington. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually at that game with my boys. So we're sitting just above y'all's on deck circle. Okay. And Cash comes out of the dugout. And I think to myself, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you going out to the mound right now? I don't care. It didn't matter who was coming up. Obviously, it was Seeger and Betts. They both punched out twice. The yep. Two times I faced him. And he's coming out to the mound. I was like, Kevin, do not do this. I play with Kevin. I'm like, do yeah. not do it. He hands him the ball, and I'm like, you idiot. And I look down at Corey and Mookie, and their eyes and face light up. Like, yeah. They're like, okay, it's game on. And then from that point on, it was over with. But yeah, what was this dugout? The same. I mean, it was he he was throwing the ball so well, and we couldn't believe it. We're like, this isn't happening. No way. No way. They took him out, and we were like, holy shit, he actually took him out of the game. Like, all right, let's go, boys. Like, it's on. Like, we've gotten to this bullpen even though it was a really good bullpen, like we've gotten to these guys, like, let's go. Yeah. Game on. Yeah. All right. We, I mean. Everybody knew it. It's like, this is, oh, everybody who knows the game, like, oh, screw, screw what, screw what the numbers say at that point. Use your eyes at that point. And like, he's dominating right now. You do not take Snell out of that game. And it was just, it was, it was, it was funny for me to look down and just see on their faces, like, <laughs> idiot. <laughs> like, it's, it's over with. So we had some characters on that team, uh, you know, Kike Hernandez and Jock Peterson. Yeah. And uh, those guys were losing it. Like Kike was like doing his horse laugh super loud. Like, ah, I can't believe it took like, like guys. Were, it was like celebrating. It really yeah. was. It was crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. That awesome. JT, man, this was a lot of fun. Any, uh, any, Thing that's on your mind, last thoughts for, for the folks listening, whether it's baseball, life, D gen culture. No, man, I feel like this was uh this was cool. It was a pretty wide it was a pretty <laughs> widespread conversation and we covered a lot of stuff. I think uh I'm hoping next time I join you guys, AJ, you you got that background taken care of. It'll be better. It'll be better. <laughs> I understand. Listen, I the good news is I've set the bar low. Right at this point, anything I do is better than a white T-shirt on a white background. So I feel like it's only up from here. Yeah, I agree. I, I just want to say, you, man, what you want? Uh, you want bourbon or wine? Which one? As our inaugural guest, which one would you oh, like better? Bourbon. Okay. Bourbon. Absolutely. Right. Did I'll you get that? You. Uh, did you get the Johnny Walker gift goat collab? It's at my house. I, I was on the road when it when it showed up. Of course, my wife. Yeah, my wife's like, 
what you ordered a bottle of alcohol? I don't know, no, babe. It's fine. It's it's it's, it's free. Scary. It's free. A, it's the gift goat, babe. Right. She's like, what gift goat? Oh my god! Like, they did they did a good job with it. It came out nice. You're gonna like it. It's like custom yeah. engraved and everything. It's dope. A bunch of people are posting it on on yeah. Super Bowl. I've seen a few of the bottles. It, it looks sick. I can't wait to put it on my. It bar. came out nice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Appreciate you, JT. This was fun, brother. All right, guys. Thanks. I get it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Going Deep. To learn more about Vayner Sports Pass, please follow us on Twitter at BS Pass. Also, don't forget to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel.